Good morning, and welcome to the Symposium on the Ethical Use of Foundation Models and Enterprises, organized and hosted by the Notre Dame IBM Technology Ethics Lab. I'm Erin Clawitter, the lab's managing director, and I'm so pleased to join you from the campus of the University of Notre Dame, where the lab is physically located. From here, Notre Dame faculty collaborate with researchers at IBM to provide practical models and applied solutions for ethical technology design, development, and deployment. We also support applied projects initiated by researchers across the world, many of whom are joining us here today. As you know, today's event focuses on the ethical use of foundation models and enterprises. We're approaching this issue from a variety of perspectives drawn from academia, civil society, and industry. We've divided the symposium into two parts, each initiated with a keynote address and followed by a panel discussion. In the first part of the symposium, we will focus on the fundamentals of foundation models in order to learn what foundation models are and how they are used in enterprise contexts. In the second part, we will grapple with the ethical challenges raised by these socio-technical systems, particularly as they are deployed in enterprises, and, and consider the opportunities presented by them, the risks associated with their use, and potential guardrails. As you have likely noticed, today we are using a webinar format to host the symposium, which means only our keynote speakers, moderators, and panelists will be visible to you, and you may enter and leave the webinar at your convenience. We have allotted time at the end of each keynote address and panel for you to pose questions, which you may do by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as possible during the allotted time and plan to conclude the symposium in just under two and a half hours from now at 12.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. With those few housekeeping items now out of our way, please allow me to introduce our first keynote speaker. Arvind Karanakaran is an assistant professor at Stanford University in the Department of Management Science and Engineering and an affiliate of Stanford's Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence Initiative. His research draws on organizational theory and the sociology of work in the professions to examine authority and accountability in the workplace, especially in the context of technological change. He received his PhD from the MIT Sloan School of Management. Today, we are pleased that he will introduce the topic of foundation models to us in his talk, Foundation Models in the Workplace, Implications for Governance. Welcome, Arvind. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Erin. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so hope you could see my slides and uh, hear me well. Great. So, so excited to be here, uh, start this, uh, this particular webinar. So my background, as Erin said, is in organizations and organization studies. So I look at how technologies are used inside the workplace, what kind of implications does it produce, both for managers, but especially for the workers who are using this uh, technology. So in the past, I've studied uh, the use of platforms like internal social media inside companies. So, so right now, my focus is all on uh, the use of generative AI and foundation models in the workplace and what kind of implications and reverberations does it produce across the organization? So let me jump right in. Uh, so uh, people have used the term foundation models, large language models interchangeably. Uh, uh, so these are like models trained on like massive data, essentially the ent entirety of the internet. Uh, and it's uh now after the release of uh, chat gpt like it, it it got like a lot more attention from the general public but even before the the release of chat gpt organizations have been like using some forms of foundation models large language models in their workplace and especially in industries such as like legal and customer service uh, so these are like uh, think of them as like uh, question and response, like uh, uh, where you could ask a question as if you're chatting with like a friend and uh, uh, the chatbot that is like based on large language models would give an answer, uh, right? So the lot of like discussions, especially after the last like few months about, you know, how much impact uh, do these technologies are going to have inside the workplace? Are most of the jobs going to get replaced? And if so, what should we do? And the discussion has been like quite sort of polarized. Some saying, you know, it's going to be an existential threat. A lot of jobs are going to get 
irrelevant. Others are saying, no, no, no. Uh, from the history of technology, like what we know is the impact is going to be a lot more subtler. There's a lot more job reconfiguration as opposed to outright job replacement, right? So the, the take that I'm going to uh, provide today is like focused uh, to move the focus from jobs to tasks. Uh, right. So if we could think of jobs, like any job, like a job of a professor, a job of a software programmer, they are essentially bundles of tasks that are assembled together in a certain way. Right. There are multiple different tasks that we perform. Uh, and what these foundation models or large language models are good at essentially is to you know, automate certain tasks within a job and not the entire job in itself, right? At least as of now, that's the skill that these models have. Uh, uh, so therefore, like what has the broader question that I'm trying to think of is uh, what happens when some tasks are automated or augmented for that matter, where uh, you're able to do the task much faster, but you still need a human in the loop. So, but essentially the question is what would happen in an organizational context if, some of the tasks are automated uh, while others are not. And the broader move that I'm trying to make is like, we tend to think of tasks in an organizational context within a job as Lego bricks, right? They could be exchanged if some tasks are replaced, that person could take on additional tasks, uh, right? But how true is it in reality in empirically? Uh, are tasks just like plug and play components that could be interchanged easily? Or are they like a lot more complicated, a lot more interwoven into the fabric of the organization, right? So that's the broader sort of uh, theoretical move where move from a plug and play view of tasks to a more ecological view of tasks where tasks are embedded into and playing a very important role in structuring the workplace relationships. And therefore what happens when a task gets automated or augmented what are the reverberations, the upstream and downstream consequences, uh, especially when it happens through the use of a generative AI and uh, foundation models? So the concept that we're trying to build on is from the sociologist Harrison White. So he talked about the notion of job vacancy chains in the labor market context. So imagine if a CEO of a company uh, resigns and the vice president becomes the CEO and the director then becomes the vice president. It creates like a chain of consequences. Sometimes these folks are hired from the internal labor market within the company, sometimes outside. So he tried to model what would happen when the job uh, vacancy opens up. So we're trying to apply a similar concept, but in the, in the context of jobs and tasks, what happens when the task gets automated or what happens when the task gets augmented using large language models and generative AI. So that's the broader question. The context we are looking at, and I like to look at things empirically than just modeling. Uh, uh, so the context is the legal industry, uh, especially corporate law firms, and they have been using uh, foundation models, large language models, chatbots, like the last like a uh, couple of years. So, so we started this project almost a year and a half ago. Uh, the specific company is called Legal Co, a pseudonym, a mid-sized corporate law firm in the Bay Area. And this uh, technology, the law bot, they used again, trained using uh, a lot of like um, massive data sets related to law, legal cases, contracts, NDAs that corporate law firms use. The mainly used by people in the paralegals and legal secretaries and in this particular firm. So let me briefly walk through uh, what does like a law firm do, how is it structured, and then jump into what happens when the law bot was used by the paralegals to automate some of their tasks, what were the consequences. Uh, for the people, but also for the organization as a whole. So very quickly, law firms such as Legal Code, typically it is organized. They have the managing partners and the senior partners, the top management. Then the firm is organized around different divisions. Like um, uh, there might be one division focused on patent law, another division on you know, some other aspects of law. And each division has this uh, pretty much an identical structure. You'd have an account manager uh, who would interface with the clients, like uh, in charge of bringing in new business. There'd be a senior associate attorney 
who's in charge of the broader legal strategy for the client, does some legal research, finalize all the documents, but large part interface with the clients, uh, their corporate clients. Uh, then you have junior attorneys to help the senior associate attorneys with legal research, drafting legal documents. Uh, then like you would have the paralegals uh, who are the ones who assist the attorneys do like multiple jobs, multiple tasks. A lot of their time is spent doing due diligence, help preparing contracts and non-disclosure agreements for the clients. And then the legal secretaries or legal assistants, they help the paralegals in drafting documents. They coordinate across these different uh, people. Right. So this is the structure. And the study is we're starting with like a qualitative ethnographic approach, looking at what, how were things done before, during, and after the adoption of this like law bot at Legal Co. And we are comparing two divisions within this company, both like identical in many different uh, dimensions. They do the same business, uh, the same kind of clients, like similar in terms of the number of people, the number of uh, managers, and so forth. So we did observations, shadowing is still like a work in progress. We, we looked at the usage logs of LawBot, like who are using it, what kind of consequences. And we are in the process of uh, like designing a field experiment to understand the impact of this technology. So let me share some preliminary findings and then like uh, take your questions. So the first question we are interested in and uh, which intrigued our interest is that we observed like significant variation uh, in the usage of law board by paralegals in division one and division two. And as I said, these two divisions are similar in many respects, even culturally, it's not that one division was more toxic than the other. It's not that one division was high performing than others, both were equally high performing. So we were like, you know, interested in why is this variation? In fact, there's 58% more usage of law bot by paralegals in Division A than Division B. So we're interested in that. But even beyond just mere usage, uh, the paralegals in Division A were experimenting more with uh, this technology. Uh, uh, they're trying to, you know, use more advanced features. They were like more depth of usage happening than in Division B. Uh, even more than experimentation, they were able to even discover new use cases for this uh, law bot. Uh, for instance, like this was initially designed to make their uh, design their contracts, come up with the NDAs quicker by merging different clauses from the history of uh, uh, contracts and NDAs. But uh, the paralegals were using it to do like legal research to basically identify prior similar cases to, you know, uh, identify others uh, legal precedents. So which was not initially the intent of this technologies, but they were able to identify these new use cases. And even further beyond discovering new use cases, they were sharing this knowledge uh, that they found this new use case for this uh, law bot with other paralegals and other their colleagues within the division. Uh, in division B, there was some experimentation and even if uh, the paralegal in division B discovered new use cases, they did not share them with the other paralegals, right? So we were sort of intrigued by what is going on. Why is this like uh, given the incentive structures are the same, the culture of the two divisions are more or less the same. So therefore it all like boiled down to the role that the managers and senior associates in these two divisions play, right? In division B, uh, as, suppose, as compared to division A, where there was more usage, more experimentation, division B, less usage, less experimentation. There was no signal from the managers that you could use this technology, this uh, law bot uh, that uses, again, like large language models uh, to reskill or upskill and fundamentally reimagine the nature of their job. So what does a paralegal constitute today? But what do you want it to be you know, five years from now? And what does your ideal job look like, right? So therefore, that there's no clear signaling. It was more like, okay, use this technology, do things quickly, try to automate some stuff, right? So therefore, that this lack of signaling, lack of messaging about potential for reskilling and reimagining the nature of the job led to fears of consolidation uh, among the paralegals. They thought they're going to just become a shared service. They'll be consolidated centrally, which in turn might lead to long-term concerns about job replacement, right? In Division A, as, as, a, as, as opposed to Division B, 
uh, the managers there, they did not promise again that, no, you're not, your jobs are all safe, like you're not going to get replaced because that's, you know, uh, that's difficult to do in practice. Uh, rather, the signaling was uh, there is an opportunity for you to reskill and upskill your job and reimagine what a paralegal is like uh, five years from now. Uh, so therefore, the managers started introducing this technology way like, with this sort of uh, framing saying, what are the tasks that you hate to do? Start with that first. Use this law board to you know, automate, augment the tasks that you hate to do. And then what else do you want to be involved in within the company? What other tasks or activities you want to be involved in? Could you find the slack time to do all of that in addition to what you're doing already, but of the same quality? So there's, again, some signal that like, if you want to upskill and move up or do different kinds of activities that you're not, say, if you want to interface more with the clients or get involved in the legal strategy meetings, uh, there is room to do that in so far as you're able to take care of your other main tasks, such as, you know, coming up with these NDAs and contracts, doing due diligence carefully, right? So this was a very clear uh, uh, messaging difference that we observed multiple times in meetings, in the email conversations, and in the Slack messages and so forth. So therefore, the paralegals in Division A, they were like uh, talking in terms of, I want to find out what tasks I could do faster. We paralegals hate doing NDAs and contracts, but most of us like doing research. And we would love to be part of the legal strategy meetings, which they were not part of before. At least observe them so that I could identify how, could, how, I, how to do the NDAs and contracts faster using law bots. Perhaps I could then lobby my manager to include me in those legal strategy meetings and client interface, right? So this is folks from the paralegals from the division A of this company. In the other division, the paralegals where I don't like law board. I don't find it useful. It's a pain. It has a lot of issues and we don't trust it enough to use it every day. Again, it's the same technology, same sort of use cases, but you see divergence on how the paralegals view this technology, view its usefulness and how much they experiment, discover new use cases, share them with others, right? So that matters. Then like, okay, the, then let's look at just the division A for now. Uh, given that the paralegals are using this technology a lot more uh, uh, to do not just like NDAs and contracts, but other more upskill tasks, such as interfacing with clients, legal research, in, uh, involving themselves in legal strategy meetings to do background research, stuff that they don't used to do that much before, right? So what's the consequence of that? It created like a task vacancy chain, as I mentioned before, which in turn enabled the people who used to support them, the legal assistants and legal secretaries, uh, to do even more complicated tasks uh, that they used to than they used to before, right? The legal secretaries, they used to draft just legal documents, coordination. Uh, they used to come up with like NDAs and client contracts, but the, now they were doing a lot more like uh, complicated tasks. Uh, but paradoxically, the legal secretaries over time, the last uh, year and a half, they were replaced and reduced in the number and they were consolidated into a shared service, right? So the paralegals in division A were not, but the legal secretaries in division A, the same division got like consolidated. And it again, like empowered others, uh, people in this like coordination chain, the summer attorneys and clerks, they were doing a lot more complex legal research, right? So I'll wrap up with the last couple of slides. So you would expect that this process of upskilling and reskilling and reimagining one's job would happen unproblematically as these technologies are getting used a lot more to automate or augment like low level tasks. But unfortunately, that didn't happen, even though the paralegals are able to do their regular work faster, the contracts and NDAs much, much faster. And now they're able to get in, themselves involved in legal strategy meetings. There was actually pushback from the junior attorneys in the division. Uh, so, uh, once the paralegals were part of these legal strategy meetings, they were doing a lot more of this work. The junior attorneys who supported the senior attorneys and the account managers, they started pushing back saying the paralegals are not trained to do these things, such as, you know, getting involved in legal strategy, doing some uh, concrete like, uh, background research. 
if they do all of this or, but screw up their main task and make mistakes that their client catches at the end of the day that would be embarrassing for all of us and that's not good so let's let's just stick with what we do best and do it perfectly right so as you could see uh the uh, the attorney the junior attorney here has some kind of like jurisdictional issue that the paralegals they are not trained to do it we are the ones who are trained to do it so therefore they push back uh, from the participation of the paralegals in these meetings, right? So what does this suggest? Again, the technology might allow certain forms of upskilling or reskilling, but the internal organizational dynamics matters a lot more. Uh, and therefore, uh, there's some limit to upskilling if we don't consider these jurisdictional conflicts and issues into consideration. And finally, the other complication that happened is Given that the paralegals are now interfacing with the clients a lot more, they now had to report to two different lines of authority, one to the legal function, to the attorneys, and now to the business development function, to the account managers, given they are interfacing a lot more with the clients. So they had like two supervisors almost, and which in turn created resistance from the legal force, saying paralegals are part of our unit. They should mainly be reporting to us, not to the cons folks. That's unproductive. That doesn't make sense, right? So what does all of this entail? Uh, the idea is that technologies such as uh, generative AI and uh, chat GPT or other uh, large language models could like, you know, automate some tasks, but augment some, some other tasks. That's something that we know. But the, the implication is that it would enable upskilling or reskilling of, of jobs like uh, uh, such as the paralegals. But there are some limits uh, to this. There are some organizational and jurisdictional limits to doing this. And we have to be careful about it. We have to first like enable the folks who are actually using this technology to experiment more, to discover new use cases. That's where you find a lot of value. But if you do, if you fail to do that, like even though there is potential in these technologies, there is a lot less trust in them. Like so, people stop using these technologies. The other broader point is that the distinction that the literature on AI draws between automation and augmentation, as if like some jobs are you know pre-selected for automation while others are just for augmentation. As this case illustrates, the distinction is a little bit getting like you know murkier. So the same job, there is potential for automation and augmentation at the same time. All depends on the role that managers and the workers themselves play. And for that to happen, we need to have other broader organizational and governance structures in place to make this transition happen, to make people rediscover, reimagine the nature of the jobs and not just view it as some kind of like a threat uh, where everybody is going to get replaced, but rather as an opportunity to rethink what kind of work that we like to do, we want to do, what kind of work that could be taken care of using these technologies. So that's the broader sort of uh, takeaway. As I said, it's still work in progress. So would love your questions and comments. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. All right, so I can take questions, yes. So I see one from Frank. Uh, what is the outcome of using the law bot? So the, the question is, what is the outcome of using the law bot? Better cases, one, what is the measurement of success? More uh, research of using, yeah, exactly. So uh, that's a little bit difficult to actually track, but in general, what we found was where the division that used the law bot more, uh, they were able to take care of what they refer to as grunt work or work that involved like more mundane sort of uh, task. Uh, they were able to, like, you know, do that much faster, which in turn enabled the paralegals to participate in more advanced sort of work. Does that translate to success in winning cases? That would be difficult to say, given there are so many other unobserved variables, right? Maybe the nature of the case itself, maybe, but generally there's a lot more, folks were a lot more, not just productive, but doing more complicated work that made them actually feel happy right they, they're doing more complex work that is aligned with their the nature of their skills all right okay 
Wonderful. Thank you, Arvind. What an interesting study. And thanks. Oh, we just got one more question and we do have time for it if you'd question. like to, and then we'll move on. Got it. Okay. So the question is, what was the goal of the management? Get more value from their staff or reduce staff? Great question. They didn't have an explicit goal. Like, right. So when they started, it was like, okay, this is a new technology. And as I mentioned, this was like before the whole hype around uh, generative AI and LLMs, like almost a year and a half ago, right? So they were like, okay, this is yet another new technology. Let's try it out. Let's see like what uh, value. So the one objective is to improve productivity, right? That was their goal. Uh, so therefore they were not explicitly concerned about either reducing staff or like, you know, getting more work out of the staff. Uh, but it turned out that the two divisions implemented, introduced the technology differently. One with the potential to upscale, rescale, reimagine another without that messaging, which in turn produced different dynamics, right? So therefore the implication is how do you introduce these technologies? What kind of messages you send matters a lot and how people on the ground use, experiment, discover new use cases. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. You're very welcome. Let's now turn to our first panel, which will further explore some of the issues Arvind raised in his talk. I will introduce our moderator who will in turn introduce the panel. Sashruti Swaminathan is an advocate for trustworthy AI and a data scientist. Her passion is to dive deep into the ocean of data, extract insights, and use AI for social good. She is the board program advisor and data scientist for the Ethics by Design group at IBM and has spoken at more than 70 events worldwide over the past three years. The Women in AI team recognized her as one of one, the 100 brilliant women in AI ethics 2022. She holds a master's degree in electrical engineering, specializing in data science from San Jose State University. Today, she will be moderating a panel concerning foundation models and the current landscape of their use in enterprises, and she will now introduce our panelists. Thank you, Sashriti. Thank you so much, Erin. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today and being a part of the event. I hope you are having a fantastic learning and discussion here. Uh, as Erin mentioned, I'm Sashruti Swaminathan, Ethics by Design Program Advisor and Data Scientist from IBM. Uh, so now let's get straight into the discussion. Today's panel topic is introduction to foundation models and the current landscape of their use in enterprises. So we are currently witnessing a paradigm shift in AI from building models to perform a specific task to building reusable models. Breakthroughs are coming at a rapid pace. There are you know, from automating tasks to workflow, generating content, images, video, and the list of applications keep growing. And recent developments are clearly capturing everyone's curiosity and taking the world by storm. So we have two experts with us today who are here to help us catch up to the pace of the technology growth. In no particular order, it's my pleasure to introduce Alex Angler, a fellow at the Brookings Institution and associate fellow at the Center for European Policy Studies, where he studies the implications of artificial intelligence on society and governance. He also teaches classes on data science and policy at Georgetown University's Meghard School of Public Policy, where he is an adjunct professor and affiliated scholar. So he earned a Master of Public Policy at Georgetown and a Master of Science in Predictive Analytics at Northwestern University. Welcome, Alex, and thank you so much for joining us today. And our second panelist is Manish Goel, our Vice President and senior partner and global leader of IBM Consulting, Artificial Intelligence and Analytics Practice. In this role, his consulting practice is responsible for bringing the best AI and analytics solution to help enterprise transform their business and capture the tremendous value from the disruption AI offers. He works with clients across banking, insurance, telco and media, and government helping them apply and scale AI in their operations. He holds an MBA from New York University Stern School of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome Manish Goel. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us, Manish. So, Welcome. Thank you for having us. 
Yeah, so given the solid background and experience of our panelists, we hope at the end of the session, you'll be able to understand the basics and importance of foundation models, get a view of how enterprises are interested in using foundation models, upcoming regulation, and if time permits, we will even cover the importance of transparency and governance here. So we'll start with panelists' remarks on the topic. Uh, we'll go deep into the topic later, but on a high level, could you share, us, uh, share with us your perception about foundation model? How do you see this paradigm shift and what do you think is exciting and challenging? So Alex, would you like to go first? Sure, I'm happy to. And, and thanks again for having me in. Um, yeah, it certainly is an interesting time. Um, maybe very broadly, you can think of foundation models um, as somewhat typically around three types of data, um, language and words. Uh, images, sometimes called computer vision, and audio sound. Um, the reason that's helpful is because despite the fact that you could argue that there's sort of a broader conception, the vast majority of the time, those are the three types of data we're talking about, um, and that's going to be foundational. So um, tasks that involve language, that involve computer vision or images, and tasks that involve uh, audio have all improved somewhat because of the advances in foundation models. And that's honestly the first takeaway is if you're working with that type of data, the possibilities probably just got a little more impactful for you to work um, with those underlying data sets. Now, that doesn't mean magically we have artificial general intelligence, you can solve any task, but at least marginally and sometimes significantly, all of tasks based on those data have gotten more impactful. As to what foundation models are, they're simply models built on that type of data that are typically quite large, meaning the underlying data is uh, pretty expansive, uh, as well as the amount of compute being used to develop the model is relatively high and, and certainly getting higher. Um, and maybe a, a little bit about when we say foundation, the idea here is that those models are relatively large and intended to be retrained for other purposes. So that's kind of how you get to this general usefulness because they're relatively large, relatively powerful on a very common type of data and designed or beneficial to be used for other purposes. That's how you, how you get this broad scale of impact across many, many different applications. Manesh, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I think you, you covered it really well, Alex, in terms of sort of, you know, what they are and, you know, why they are sort of a, a shift uh, from, you know, the techniques that were being used before, right? And one of the sort of points I want to emphasize that you mentioned, right, and why they're called foundational models, because, you know, you can build a number of different things on top of it, right? And foundation models, you know, one of the characteristics of foundation models are they're pre-trained, Right, they're pre-trained on a broad, uh, you know, a very large data set, and because of that large data set, they learn, uh, you know, the um, the nuances of language and other things, right, images, etc., which then can be used to fine tune for task specific, uh, you know, jobs, uh, which is sort of the main difference from uh, techniques that were being used previously, right, wherein you had to create a model for each specific task, right which basically raised the investment that uh, enterprises, you know, had to put in, right, to get the value. And that's why it's gotten so, uh, so much attention uh, from business leaders and, and everyone in terms of sort of the, you know, you started to see the potential of the, you know, the lowering of the investment needed and, you know, uh, ROI being available for tasks that previously said, yeah, we're not going to try and attempt to do that. So those are some of the things that make them very, very attractive uh, and uh, why they, you know, we see so much attention uh, being spent on them. And then the other thing I'll add is, right, I mean, it's not that these foundation models suddenly happened in the last six months. You know, the work on this has been happening for multiple years, right? I mean, the original, you know, uh, paper from Google was 2018, right? So it's been multiple years at this thing. Uh, I think what happened with ChatGPT in around the November timeframe, right, which was again, right, they just put a, a, a interface to allow everyone to interact with these models and they just happened to get it right uh, and iterated really quickly on it, which allowed a whole bunch of people uh, to interact directly with AI, 
versus in the previous paradigms, right? You know, AI was um, in products and services, but not necessarily explicitly, uh, you know, uh, customers were interfacing with it directly. And, and that sort of shifted things, right? And uh, I think, you know, over the holidays, everybody started playing around with ChatGPT. It was a lot of fun. Um, and that sort of in that and the uh, you know open source innovation that happened around the same time has made the last uh, you know five months just incredibly uh, interesting uh, in in the space. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your views. I think these are great points, and I think we have the perfect base now. So I'm just going to slowly move to the second phase here. Uh, so I've compiled a few questions based on the topic. Uh, and panelists experience in this field so we can gain knowledge from their experience so as we discuss please add you know uh wh whoever is listening like please add your questions using q a feature and after the segment we'll get into you know audience question and answer uh part as well so uh just taking a step back uh i think manish you have already covered this but just you know uh just want to reiterate uh just want to ask this question to reiterate your point so what are the characteristics of foundation model in I mean, specifically, like what differentiates foundation model from other types of AI model, right? Because it's quite confusing uh, when you want to, you know, really see, okay, is this a foundation model or not? You know, so I, I want to just like get your view uh, on, you know, what are the characteristics you think, you know, make up the foundation model? So um, I'll, I'll sort of lay out. Uh, three, uh, four or five things, right? So one, you know, they are trained on large data sets, right? And, you know, you've seen sort of, you know, if you follow the space, right, there are numbers of, you know, five, five, you know, 500 billion parameter models, you know, 175 billion parameter models. And then you have a whole bunch of them that are, you know, 10, 20, you know, and smaller as well, right? But the idea is that you're using a large amount of data, right? Uh, you know, the, the data sets vary, you know, the pile uh, as is sort of a commonly uh, common data set that gets used, right? Um, so one is large uh, data sets. Second, they're pre-trained, right? So they are uh, trained in advance for a general task, right? Which might be predicting the next word kind of a thing. Um, and uh, so this pre-training phase, right, introduces, um, you know, allow these models to learn about the language, you know, or other types of data uh, before they are fine-tuned for a specific task, right, which is sort of the next thing, right? These models are fine-tunable. Uh, so that's why they call foundational. And then you can, you know, uh, variety of different techniques, right, through prompting or other techniques to tune them for a specific task. Um, and, you know, they're broadly capable. Uh, now, all of these things became possible for a number of things to come together, right? You know, the uh, the compute available to be able to do this, right? The GPUs and advancements there, the data that that's available, right? The cloud infrastructure that's available. So all of these things sort of made these foundation models uh, possible. And there's been a ton of innovation, right, in terms of the uh, machine learning, deep learning techniques itself, right? The transformer model, right was one of the you know, key uh innovations that happened you know uh from google and then people have built on top of that with other things as well so th these are sort of the characteristics that differentiate foundation models from you know other techniques that were being used before which were you know sort of much more task specific and required a lot more uh uh training uh data that had to be provided right curated which these don't uh, do not require Perfect. Thank you so much. And Alex, uh, would you like to add something? Sure. To um, that, that's a great overview. The only thing I'd add is that, you know, as a, a data scientist for 10 years, and one of my defining experiences of data science was how strong the community and professional incentives are to make technology and systems that other people can use. Um, what I mean by that is some of the really like well-known people in data science are open source package contributors. Um, they are people who write great documentation and great blog posts even, or even describe machine learning concepts in Crayon in a somewhat famous example of Chris Alvin. And so you have a really strong community around knowledge sharing and a really strong uh, set of professional incentives around building tools that make um, 
complicated math easier. Uh, and to be honest, the average data scientist probably can't build a really large foundation model. That's not a criticism, but they're, the average data scientist is a better problem solver and inference, like doing inference around data and exploratory data analysis than they are straight computer scientist and statistician, which means that suddenly the large, like wide availability of open source versions of these models around large language models, large computer vision models, large audio models, means that they absolutely can learn how to use them. They can learn how to find tools and packages that make it easy to deploy them for commercial purposes. And so they get all the benefit, even if they couldn't make the model in the first place. Not a criticism of my field. I fall absolutely into that category of use someone else's hard work to make complicated math, do something meaningful. Absolutely the, the, the part of data science I operated in. Um, but it's easy to think, well, these models are so hard to use, but every day they're getting easier to deploy. Every day it's easier to throw them up onto a cloud machine and have them running in, in you know minutes or, or, or hours. And you see new packages like Langchain is a very common one now that makes using large language models extraordinarily easy relative to where we were. Um, even if you go back like like 10 years ago, you would say that very little of this existed. Even if you count early advances like uh, uh, vector embeddings, which go back to 2014, maybe you would say, oh, there's no way a normal data scientist uses That's pretty incredible change for the average data scientist to be able to work with um text and video and audio and in really a, a fundamentally changed way and okay. just one other thing i'll add sai shruti right you know yeah you know, i've been around uh for a number of tech disruptions over the last you know 15 20 years i have not seen anything in terms of the level of innovation right of and the speed of innovation that has happened in the last six months uh ever before it, it is almost impossible to sort of keep pace with uh, you know, what's happening in the open source community, you know, the things that, uh, you know, people are building, especially to your point, Alex, right? I mean, it has suddenly opened up, not just to, you know, the data scientists, but, you know, uh, developers who can now tap into the capabilities of the foundation models, right? And, and you know, uh, build them into applications and workflows uh, that they have. So just a tremendous amount of uh, innovation that is happening on top of uh, foundation models. Perfect. So uh, I have a slightly, you know, I have a related, a slightly related question. So we have two worlds that are similar and different in a certain way, right? like foundation models and generative AI. So foundation models are generative in nature because of the technology used to build the models. Uh, so I think it's important to understand the nuance, like what is similar and what is different. Right? So what is the relationship and difference between foundation models and generative AI? Uh, so. Sure. Yeah, uh, I can I can give a quick example or two, and I think it's worth clarifying that I actually think for business and commercial purposes, the foundation model aspect of this is more immediately and obviously transformative. And by that, I mean, you can take these foundation models and use them for traditional things that you would have used machine learning for, but now it's much better and much more accessible. A really easy example of this is you're a company, you have a huge number of documents and some sort of automated document processing system, but they're all very different and they're all not um, routinely categorized or they come from many different sources. Real estate is a really great example of this where you might have tons and tons of different documents. A large language model that's pre-trained on tons and tons of language data that you then adapt to your specific task is going to do much better document classification, as in this is an underwriting document and this is a mortgage and this is a bank statement. It's going to be much better at that than a model five or 10 years ago. And that's a really great example of a use of a foundation model. It is not a generative use. The generative use is something different. Um, let me give you one more example. A generative in this case would be creating text, actually writing text like we see from chat GBT or creating new images like we've seen from things like stability AI or actually as was just introduced um, into Adobe Illustrator to actually some somewhat beautiful effect. Um, and I'll give you one other example. My dad really is a birder. He really loves this app that tells him it listens to bird calls and it identifies the bird species. That is a fancy new thing that we couldn't have really done five years ago, but that is a foundation model. 
It is really listening to bird songs and applying a species of bird, matching it to a species of bird. So that's cool. It's dealing with audio data, but it's not generating anything super interesting. It's not generating audio content. Now, what would be a generative version is actually listening to a bunch of bird songs and then generating a unique or novel bird song. And that's the difference. It's the difference between sort of an older classification type. Is this A or B or is this five or 10 versus let's generate new um, content in the form of text or video or imagery or audio. Um, and I think broadly that's the distinction. And we're seeing a new move towards these generative models in commercial applications, but we should be cautious here. They are less obviously robust and less obviously mature in that phase. I think we're still seeing some, some early um, development challenges there. Thank you, Alex. And Manish, should you like to add something to that? No, I mean, I think Alex uh, covered it really well, right? I mean, uh, you know, generative models, uh, you know, generate, you know, audio, uh, you know, images, video, uh, text, right? I mean, they're, they're specialized for that. Foundation models are more broad. You know, some foundation models also generate, uh, you know, you have generative properties, but not all foundation models, you know, have to do that. And I think Alex uh, provides some really great examples uh, of that. Perfect. So now I feel uh, we have provided, you know, good overview of the basics, right? Like what foundation models are generated where and the difference and similarities. Now I want to get us to the use, you know, the usage part of it. Uh, so I have, uh, you know, two enterprise related question for Manish and two policy related uh, question for Alex. So we have best of both the worlds. So uh, let me start uh, with Manish. So how are business view, you know, owners viewing the paradigm shift foundation models and where do you think it's going to help them? And will this new shift help move AI from exploration or the experimentation phase to the adoption phase? Like what's your view on yeah. that? So there's a, you know, there's just a tremendous amount of, uh, interest from enterprises, right? You know, for the reasons I said, right? Because, you know, the first time everybody can play with it. And I think there's a second reason why there's, you know, just from a timing perspective, right? I mean, this blew up, you know, over the holidays into the new year. And, uh, you know, at the same time, right, from a macroeconomic perspective, sort of, you know, you know, worries about recession, what was happening, right? Every CEO, if you sort of looked at the first, uh, you know, year end or fourth quarter, uh, you know, uh, calls, analyst calls, right? The word that they used was, you know, this is going to be a year of productivity, right? Whether it's Mark Zuckerberg, whether it's Arvind Krishna from IBM or you know, many others, right? I mean, this was sort of the year of productivity. And they saw, you know, this potential of these uh, of this technology helping with that, right? So there was a lot of interest from that perspective, uh, right? And, you know, I have done, you know, hundreds of briefings and, and discussions with clients across industries, right? And across the globe. So there's just a tremendous amount of um, uh, interest. Uh, and, you know, they're looking for, you know, the optimization that they can do, right? And much of it, you know, just because sort of some of the uh, uh, concerns that, you know, Alex has just started to allude to, right? They're looking at this, you know, mostly internal, right? How can I optimize my internal workflows using this technology, right? And that's sort of, you know, how most new technologies, even sort of the previous versions of AI, right, got adopted, right? You try it internally, you, you feel comfortable with it, and you expose that out, you know, to, uh, to your customers, clients, et cetera. And, uh, you know, so the, you know, uh, from a cross industry perspective, right, you know, we, we see a lot from a knowledge management perspective, right? The example that Alex used previously, right? Searching for knowledge within an enterprise is a cumbersome job. You can do that better, right? Almost any NLP task, natural language processing task that you were doing before can be improved with the application of these models, right? And it's pretty safe from that perspective, right? It's not generative in nature. It's just, you know, giving you better way to search that information. Now you can, you know, add to that a generative nature of summarization, right? These models are really good at summarization. So if you can, you know, ground the summarization in the information that you're saying, right? So that you, you know, uh, address the hallucination effect, right? Saying so generating stuff that doesn't exist in the data itself, right? Because of the uh, model from the large thing. If you ground it to only the data that you have, that becomes a really great use case around knowledge management, right? And that works in a number of different settings, right? 
it, it's employee facing, right? You know, you and I like searching for information within sort of the IBM, you know, uh, was corpus, or you look at it from a customer service perspective, right? Uh, agent taking a call, right? Having to search for information, right? I mean, think about it in a variety of settings, right? You know, healthcare, I'm calling about a benefit, right? It's a tricky question, right? You know, is ambulance coverage, you know, covered for this kind of situation? Well, but I live in Colorado, are there any different rules? That information, right, is embedded into large PDF documents. That can be now changed, right? And provide, you can, you know, the, the agent can provide that information uh, much better, much quicker. And that has two aspects, you know, benefits to it, right? One is a customer experience, the member experience is better, right? And on the same side, right, you're, you know, you're lowering the average handle time. So the cost of serving that information and that member lowers. That's just sort of one sort of category of example that you think. Let me sort of throw it out to, you know, other things that I found really, really interesting applications of this, right? You know, if you look at what uh, Salcan and the Khan Academy are doing, applying this, right, and really being able to make, uh, you know, learning possible to, you know, almost like having a personal tutor to anybody who wants to study any subject, right? Massive application, right? And it's done really, really neatly, uh, you know, from that perspective, right? So that's another example. And then let me take a completely different example from the traditional NLP examples, right? Uh, because, you know, these foundation models can be applied to, you know, structured data as well, right? So, you know, we've done some really cool work in IBM research applying this to time series data. And, and the example is, you know, if you look at a cement plant, right? You know, you, you know, you're creating cement. It's a very complicated process with all kinds of different inputs and variables, right? And usually there are a whole bunch of regression models that, you know, are, are helping you uh, turn all the knobs that are needed to optimize the production of cement. We've applied foundation models to the same process and seen a 7x improvement in our ability to, to uh, fine tune this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with the reduction of, you know, we used to have models for, you know, for, uh, you know, every different process. We can now reduce that to just two uh, models, two foundation models. So massive improvement, you know, applying that, right? So it's really wide in terms of uh, the application of what you can uh, do with this. And I haven't even gotten to content creation, right? Whether it's in marketing or other cases, right? Uh, huge applications of that, right? And the personalization aspect, I can personalize my marketing message to Alex, to Sai Shruti, to Manish, right? With the right images, right? Things, right? Of that nature. So again, a lot of different impacts that you can drive. Uh, through this. And that's why it's so exciting. And there's a lot of experimentation happening, right, uh, in the space. That, that, that's fascinating. Uh, I, I think on a high level, it's the use of the technology and the potential positive impacts that seems to be the motivating factor here, if if if, if I can put it in a nutshell. Absolutely. I mean, I, uh, you know, and I'm sure we're going to talk about sort of the, you know, the concerns aspects of it mm -hmm. as well, right? But, you know, uh, I, I like to take the optimist view of it, because I think, it, you know, this technology can do uh, and, and will have a lot of positive impact to society and to uh, yeah, enterprises in general, serving society. So that's a view I like to take. Uh, you know, I'm not, not foolish about, you know, the, the, the risk aspect of it, but we'll get into that as well. Yeah, so uh, I just have one follow-up question for the enterprise thing. So how, like, are there, how are enterprise customers react to the generative AI use case specifically? You know, uh, you know, or what are the industries? Like, we have discussed about the use cases, but on a high level, what are the industries that you know, foundation model and generative AI could have significant impact? So it's it's almost every industry that's looking at it, right? Um, you know, whether it be uh, you know in uh, you know, in financial services, right, where in, you know, in health management, I can generate a more specific and personalized uh, report and advice to you using this, right, or I can summarize a whole bunch of financial information for you, right, and these are applications, you know, that, that uh, you know, uh, the financial institutions are doing today, right, uh, you know, if you are in retail travel, right, again, you know, the, um, the personalization of offers uh, that might uh, there be, right? From the sales side, right? I can summarize my sales interactions, right? And make my sellers more productive, right? Um, and, and be able to, you know, give them more signals into what Manisha's preferences are so that they can reach out to me appropriately and, and have higher odds of closing the sale, right? 
I gave you an example uh, on the industrial side, right? With you know a structured data and you know applying of these things. Um, similarly, from uh, from a you know a public sector government uh, organizations, right? There's a whole bunch of process efficiency regarding across every enterprise. If I look across sector, right? You look at the middle office, right? Procurement, right? I mean, all the things that make enterprises work, right? There's tremendous uh, opportunity to look at those end-to-end -end workflows and look at everywhere where a lot of time gets spent by humans curating, looking at this document, looking at this document, matching stuff up, right? Wherein, again, it's not generative in nature, but just so much better NLP techniques can be applied to this, right, to optimize those workflows. So that is sort of what it is. On the generated nature, right, so going back to the first part of the question, there is um, uh, there's trepidation, right, because there is enough evidence of, you know, these technologies making stuff up, right? And again, there are various ways and techniques that you can ground this information and avoid those. But, you know, there are enough uh, um, examples of things going wrong here that uh, you know uh, our you know enterprises are experimenting with it and really probing on how do I ensure that this is not going to make stuff up right and provide wrong information to my employees or to my uh, clients and that is a, a you know absolutely a serious concern there. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing your view and I have uh, just quickly getting into the risk and the regulation part of it uh, and then we'll straight away you know get into the uh, audience question and answer so we have questions coming up so for alex like we have seen benefits use all the excitement you know we have discussed about all the excitement the technology brings on the other side how do you think uh you know uh, generative ai can be misused and what are the factors enterprise should be careful about and how the policy world sees the recent paradigm shift can you share your views here sure and i may build up a couple of Manisha's points too so you know i definitely agree with the core sort of claim in, in his argument that the foundation models are really broadly useful if you have any sufficient amount of data around text or video or audio that matters you probably have a use for foundation models and, and um one example i like in that space is automated uh property valuations so all property is given an evaluation by an algorithm in the united states and in, in many countries uh and these are not new these models are probably at least 40 years old and a slow uh in, increase in their use and so those of us who have been studying this for a long time are a little resistant to the term ai because this is like just decades long incremental increases in use of algorithms right that's how a lot of us see it and certainly how i see it um but one thing that automated valuation models have not traditionally done is included property condition by that i mean they are looking at numbers you can write down how many bathrooms what's the square footage does it have a pool or a yard what's the walkability score of the neighborhood a thing that a modern foundation model is doing, this is being used by companies that do automated valuation models, is saying, if you upload photos, we will calculate the scores based on those photos on the property condition of the house. And thus, it's not necessarily just um, here are basic features, but also is like what physical condition is the home in, are various pieces uh, damaged, is the roof in good shape, things like that. And these are new models, and they'll probably go through some uh, bumps in development, but I expect that to be something we look back on and say, yeah, that's just a part of what these models do now. They have added condition of properties to uh, to automated valuation. That's the kind of thing that maybe doesn't make the headlines, but is definitely a big change in probably that whole industry. And we'll look back as as though that was inevitable and you know, sort of just part of the process. And again, tons of examples of that type of thing in foundation models. Generative AI, much less clear. Um, I'll give you one example where I think it's definitely going to be helpful um, and how this is a little informative. Uh, the Philippines is a country with an enormous number of call centers. It is a huge part of their GDP and it is a huge uh, sort of outsourcing location for customer support services. So if you're a company that operates elsewhere, you might outsource your customer support services there. And they have various companies there have been um, experimenting with generative AI. What it does is it looks at past call center answers in response to a new question and provides sort of a, a good answer, a representative answer of what's been said in the past. Um, 
And it's not actually doing that in an automated way. It is suggesting that to a call center employee who can read it and say, oh, maybe that's a good answer to provide this customer. This is a good example for two reasons. Um, one, it's been shown to help. There's a study that says if you give this technology to a new call center employee, they're more helpful to the people they're talking to, it increases the speed at which they resolve complaints. So there's a little bit of evidence that says it definitely helps. And the other is that it's actually just pretty low risk. It has a direct human reviewer, someone who's reading it and saying, yeah, that makes sense. And also it's not a disaster if your customer service call doesn't go well, that's actually a pretty routine experience I think we're all familiar with. So the stakes just aren't that high in the specific circumstance. And that I think right now is where generative AI really is. It needs human review, probably relatively low stakes. When we've seen it go past that, mental health advice, for instance, it's been quite disastrous almost immediately. Um, someone, Sandra in the Q&A, mentions using generative AI in legal briefs where it invented sources and legal arguments. That is essentially exactly what I'd expect it to do. If you ask large language models really broad con conceptual questions that require anything like human reasoning, it is going to fail. Um, it is this, or is going to fail at least often. Um, these models are largely just probabilistically representing underlying text. Um, I still think we might move up to the more impactful, less human review type use of these systems that could happen, um, but it's gonna take some other clever engineering around them. Um, even things like human feedback reinforcement learning, which is one popular technique, won't make them just magically true all the time. The fundamentals of this technology mean it's going to be difficult to make them really always or even routinely very accurate, which means maybe part of these systems are built in with other safeguards could work. Um, so from a commercial aspect, they certainly have promise, um, but really need to be careful about their maturity. Um, some people call this the hallucinations problem. That's a little anthropomorphizing for me, so I just prefer to say they're kind of wrong very frequently because yep. they're just mimicking underlying text. Um, and so again, promise, but of course, some people don't care about the truth, and this gets you to your malicious use. Or maybe I should say there's two categories here. One is people are going to use these models for things they probably shouldn't be used for, um, and that's a harm. Creating automated legal advice that ends up giving people nonsense is a harm, right? Having a mental health app that in fact delivers no mental health value is a harm, especially if you're paying for it. And then of course there's malicious use as well. Um, so by making these models very, very available, they do help some people who the thing they're trying to generate is harmful. And that includes scams. Um, you know, we talk about political deep fakes a lot, but I think the predominant use of generative AI and is actually going to be for financial scams, mimicking people's uh, voices and making yep. more compelling text to convince people to give up banking information, which is going to be a problem, and also for malicious use of disinformation. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. So I, we we can quickly you know go to audience Q&A and answer some of the questions. I think we have started getting more questions there. And thank you so much for sharing your views on the risk and policy side. Uh, but yeah, uh, first question, uh, is, would you discuss the ethics of data sourcing for large language models? Many people are making claims that fair use education uh, language should cover this, but fair use is intended for educating people and a generative AI is no a human. I mean, so, I, mean I, I, I can go first. Uh, you know, you know, our perspective, at least from an IBM perspective, right, is we, we you know, we expect that we should be able to explain what the model was trained on, right? You know, what went into the model needs to be made explicit, um, you know, for, for any model. And that is sort of the take that we are, uh, you know, uh, going to have for models that IBM produces. Uh, but this is, this is um, you know, a heavily debated issue, right, um, of, you know, uh, model creators, you know, making explicit what went into the training of their models and um we're we're i mean you know the discussions that i have with uh, enterprise clients right uh they are very very uh tuned in to this fact right they really do want to understand uh right what has gone into the model um for a variety of reasons right you know uh legal is one of them 
but you know what are they using those models uh you know in terms of providing services for their clients they need to be you know they need to know for sure on this uh, alex yeah i'm you know first caveat i'm not a lawyer that being said i think the fair use educational exemption and this is like the copyright act section 107 or something absolutely should not apply and it's sort of a little ridiculous on its face I, it's it's a very convenient excuse but ai systems are products their products by any definable metric is the, the second you build one and then sell it or integrate it into something that you're selling or charging for it, it, it's a product and so i don't see how the fair use exemption um applies and, and yeah the fact you know the educational exemption is really for humans which these aren't so I, I agree that that's um somewhat silly uh you know we do have a problem enforcing current um law and uh one of which is the large absence of data privacy laws in the u.s um that's problem one we just don't have a lot of protections a good example of this is Clearview, which mass harvested facial data from the internet, was sued under the strongest state biometric information privacy law in Illinois and basically received a tiny slap on the wrist. Uh, and that is with a stronger protection around more private data. Um, and we just don't have the protections. Um, so, which is unfortunate, that's problem one. Uh, in the cases where you do have stronger protections, actually like copyright, right? Some of the copyright laws are much stronger than your basic like personal data protections. Um, a different challenge there is the companies are getting some of them progressively less likely to disclose what data was used to train it. Um, if you look at what GPT-4 was developed on under OpenAI, they say almost nothing. It makes it very, very challenging to identify uh, copyright violations or other data privacy violations. Um, I do hope that's something that changes. I do think that basic uh, disclosure requirements on the data used to develop these large models would be a, a perfectly reasonable uh, policy step and could at least partially help um, if people think their data was used irresponsibly. Um, and as a follow-up, just all of this is a general call for federal data privacy legislation. So something we unfortunately didn't quite pass last year that we're going to need to come back to. Awesome. Uh, thank you. We have four more minutes, so maybe we can just quickly take two or three more questions. Uh, so the next question is, do you feel legal consequences are coming to those enterprises using AI for any relevant purpose or harm any one group of people? Can you repeat the question? Uh, do you feel legal consequences are coming to those enterprises using AI? for any uh, you know, malevolent purpose and harm any one group of people? In the US, I uh, reasonably expect one thing certainly, which is the application of current law systemically to the use of algorithms, um, which is insufficient, but it is helpful. Um, some examples of that are making sure that anti-discrimination law in hiring applies to AI hiring systems, which our Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is working on doing. It involves making sure that algorithms used in healthcare provisioning and procurement are transparent and accurate in how they portray themselves, which our Office of National Coordination of Health IT is doing. It involves setting rules and standards for personalized learning in um, which our Department of Education is starting to do. Um, and the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, saying that you can't lie or deceive with algorithmic systems. But I could go on. Essentially, most federal agencies are starting to think seriously about how law should apply to algorithms. Unfortunately, uh, which is great. Unfortunately, that will be insufficient. There are just new harms. There are new challenges to enforcement. How do you know if you were discriminated against by an algorithm? just as one example. And so I do think we'll also need federal changes. I'm encouraged by Congress recently. It's been very involved in these topics since ChatGPT and a few other developments late last year, um, but we'll see what comes out of that. It's too early to say. I don't think we're gonna get something so systemic as for instance, the EU. Awesome. Thank you. And the next question we have here is, how do you assess bias in foundation, foundational data? And is it related to the workforce used to develop them or and or ought to train them. Basically, yes, I mean, how do you assess bias? Yeah, I and mean, so you know, 
uh, especially with foundation models, right? You know, the uh, the, the data that is uh, used to train them is a large swath of the internet data, and you can then you know just what derives from that is all the bias that is uh, you know uh, on the internet, right? Is part of the uh, the training of these foundation models. Now, you know, most uh, enterprises building these foundation models, right, attempt to, you know, uh, take that, uh, address some of that, but you cannot, you know, it's just an impossible task given, you know, the large amount of data to address that directly, uh, you know, on the front end of it. But that is why it is so, so important, right, that we really understand what data was used, right, and you clean, you, you address as much of it as possible on the uh, on the front end of it, right? Uh, what goes into the training of this data, because otherwise, you know, that is uh, that inherent bias is going to show up in the output. And there's so many examples of you know you know things that you can just ask, you know, Bard, ChatGPT, and other systems, right? And you get the bias straight up, right? I and mean, people have you know provided enough examples of that. And um, so so. That is a really critical step in terms of addressing the bias uh, thing. And then there's, you know, obviously other things and other techniques that can be applied on the other side, right, in terms of uh, addressing uh, and uh, debiasing um, these models. But to me, you know, addressing the training data is the most important one. Can I mention one quick follow-up, which is, sure. I agree, the data is a huge part of this. Um, we're also just getting better at this. There are ways to measure um, associations between words. You have the classic example of man is to doctor as woman is to nurse. That is a measurable look at gender discrimination in large language models. You can also see relationships between mentions of people with disabilities and toxicity, right? Toxic, harsher words, which will manifest in whatever application you use it for. So there are ways we're getting better at measuring these models hopefully through data and other measures, moving them towards less discriminatory use. And then also we just have to say, if you use these models for a high risk task, something like hiring, finance, um, employment measurement, healthcare, education, things that we have laws around, well, if it's discriminatory, you're going to be held to account for using that algorithm if for, you know, in a way that manifests illegal discrimination. And I think that's part of this too. Yes. Okay. I think we are on time. Uh, so I think we have, yeah, we all have a lot of questions. So thank you so much, you know, for answering all the basic questions and enterprise use, uh, you're, you know, providing your view on the risk regulations. I think we have covered, you know, a good, uh, view, uh, of, uh, you know, of concept, uh, broad concepts here. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for sharing your view. And I hope you all had great, you know, uh, session and taking a lot of insights from here. Uh, anything you'd, you'd like to share? We just have 30 seconds. Just no, I have having a great day to be here and uh, really enjoyed it. Thank thanks you. to you and to the Tech Ethics Lab for hosting. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sashruti, Manish, and Alex. We appreciate your valuable insights and the way your conversation has primed us to hear from our second keynote speaker, Casey Fiesler. Casey Fiesler is an Associate Professor of Information Science at the University of Colorado Boulder. Much of her research focuses on technology ethics and policy, notably research ethics for data science, data privacy, technological harms towards marginalized groups, content moderation, and ethical speculation in research and design. She is also an expert on ethics education in computing fields. Casey holds a PhD in human-centered computing from Georgia Tech and a JD from Vanderbilt Law School. I'm also pleased to share that Casey will serve as a visiting faculty fellow for the lab during her upcoming sabbatical year. Today, she will be presenting a talk titled Generative AI's Ethical Debt. Thanks so much, Casey. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. Uh, I'm happy to be here, and I'm especially excited to spend uh, the next year with folks at the Tech Ethics Lab. So give me... Uh, forgive me for about two seconds here. Let me share some slides. So I'm going to be talking specifically about generative AI. Um, and I only have 15 minutes, so this is going to be more of a high-level provocation uh, than 
um, a number of, then deep dives into a number of the issues that came up in the in the last panel, which was an excellent layup for for this talk. So I sometimes joke that I make slides that look like this uh, over and over until I retire. Um, this is actually the, the the first slide that I have made about generative AI specifically, and I know that everyone has has seen headlines that get at ethical issues constantly for the past six months and and even longer than that. Um, but I want to give you one very specific example, a very recent story, a, a short story told in two headlines. The first headline was eating disorder helpline fires staff transitions to chatbot after unionization. So this was last week. Um, and then five days later, just a couple a couple of days ago, this was the second headline, Eating Disorder Helpline Disables Chatbot for Harmful Responses After Firing Human Staff. Now, a number of people seeing these two headlines had responses like, wow, shouldn't they have known that would happen? Um, because what came to light was that this chatbot, which uh, was was being used to phase out um, workers who were uh, volunteers for a for a helpline, uh, it was giving harmful responses. And in response to this, um, uh, the CEO of the nonprofit said they'd taken down temporarily this program until they could understand and fix the bug. Um, it's interesting to think about this kind of a thing as a bug, right? Like a, a bug in the code, like any other, other kind of software bug. This also made me think of another situation from a few years ago where, where I heard a similar statement from a CEO. You might recall Zoom bombing uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. People were going into Zoom meetings just like this one and doing horrible things, including some of the classes at my university, which was pretty awful. And at the time, the CEO of Zoom said, we never thought about that, um, possible misuses of our technology. And this is something that came up a couple of times in the last panel, the potential for misuse of technology and how we should be thinking about that. And of course, this is just one potential type of, of technical um, issue that might come up with this kind of, of technology. So some of you might be familiar with the concept of technical debt. So this is a very common uh, concept in software engineering. And it's the idea that, uh, especially if you need to work quickly through something, you know that there's going to be bugs uh, because that's just how things work. We have bugs, but especially if we choose an easier solution now instead of something that might take longer. So you, you might've heard that Mark Zuckerberg famously once said, um, move fast and break things, a, a motto that that Facebook um, pulled back from in, in more recent years. But when you move fast, you are going to break things. And so the idea is that it's going to be harder to fix it later. So that's where the debt comes in. And when this concept was first proposed, it wasn't meant as a negative thing. Sometimes we take on debt for all kinds of good reasons. And sometimes technical debt makes sense as something that you might want to take on. Um, so in, in the wake of Zoom bombing, we started talking in my lab about the concept of ethical debt. Same kind of thing. The implied cost of not thinking through the social or ethical implications or harms now, assuming that you can fix them later after you find out what they are. The problem is that this is a very different kind of bug, right? Like, um, oh no, the submit button on my form doesn't work. It's not the same kind of bug as, oh no, my social media platform undermined democracy, or oh no, we just, you know, built an AI that got rid of a ton of jobs and then also hurt people. Um, oftentimes, the harm is already done. And my concern with how quickly everything is moving right now is that we are amassing a very large amount of ethical debt. And someday that is debt that will come due. And who is going to be paying the price? Um, I was struck in particular by this New York Times headline um, a few months ago about 
the AI race um, and evidence that some companies are choosing speed over caution. And this makes a lot of sense from a business perspective, um, because there definitely is, is a sense that if you if you don't move fast, someone else will. Um, and in an internal email uh, that the New York Times got hold of, uh, Microsoft executives said that it would be a fatal error in this moment to worry about things that can be fixed later. My provocation is that we should be worrying a lot about things that might be fixed later so that maybe we can fix them before the harm is done. Now, this can be very difficult to do. And we a buzzword that we sometimes hear um, in, in technology circles is this idea of unanticipated or unintended consequences. And unanticipated consequences is a very hard problem. Um, the reason we have them is, is often because of uncertainty or from assuming functional equivalence, like things are going to happen like they have always happened in the past, or we're going to compare this to this and know exactly what to do. AI is a particular issue when it comes to uncertainty, because uncertainty is a side effect of all technological revolutions. But AI is uncertain by design. <laughs> the entire point of generative AI is that we don't know exactly what's going to come out of it, which makes this a particularly challenging problem. However, as in the case of firing a bunch of human workers and then um, putting a chat bot in front of people who are in a very vulnerable position, it seems kind of inevitable that something might have gone wrong there. And I think there are a number of things we've seen in these headlines that suggest things that might potentially go wrong. However, it can sometimes be difficult to imagine how things might go wrong. Um, Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer, once famously said that science fiction writers foresee the inevitable and the problems and catastrophes may be inevitable solutions are not. Uh, it also doesn't tend to be the job of science fiction writers to come up with the solutions, but it is often the job of probably a lot of people who are listening to, to this talk right now. Um, and so I think that we might think how we can think a little more like science fiction writers but when I say that, I don't mean actual science fiction writers. Um, I mean, how can we think about speculation as a skill? How can we get better at it? And how can we convince ourselves that it's a very important thing to do very, very early? Um, and the reason that I that I make this distinction very clearly is because I also think that we're seeing a lot of science fiction writing right now. Um, just a few days ago, the Center for AI Safety came out with this um, statement, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. I agree with this statement uh, with one very important edit, <laughs> um, which is that I think we should be mitigating the risk of AI right now and, <laughs> and not just the risks that right now are in the realm of science fiction. Because there are a lot of things that are happening right now. I maintain um, a sort of database in a, in a Google spreadsheet of AI ethics and policy news. Um, that headline slide that I showed you earlier, just a handful of things. Um, I think I have a I think I have 130 articles in this list uh, just from May. Um, there's something new every day. Now some of it is more important than others. Some of it um, is more valid maybe than others. Um, but there are things that everyone is very concerned about right now, not just fear of super intelligence or fear of the robot wars, but things that are happening right now, bias, privacy violations, labor exploitation, issues of power. These are the things that we should be thinking about immediately. So I want to really quickly um, give you one specific example of where I think that this kind of thing happened pretty well. Um, and that has to do with um, image generators. So, you know, the stuff that we were talking about even before chat GPT. Um, so if I, so I went to mid journey back in August and asked for a, um, an image of a computer science professor and I get um, bald white men and one bald white man lecturing to a room of bald white men. Um, I asked the same thing of uh, Dolly, OpenAI's image generator, and I got something slightly different. So more diverse um, set of uh, re responses. 
there's there's a reason for this. Um, and some uh, very clever folks figured out exactly what was happening here. Um, and when I was replicating what they did, this is one of the images that Dolly gave me for a computer science professor because the actual input that I gave it was computer science professor holding a sign that says, what OpenAI is doing um, in DALI is that they are appending demographic words to the end of a small part of the search results. So here you see um, three male scientists and a woman scientist, and the woman scientist is holding a sign that is a garbled version of the word female because the word female is being appended onto the back end of that um, prompt. So this was a this is a bias mitigation band aid um, that Dolly is using right now, and you might ask yourself like, oh well, um, why did why why does it really really matter this kind of thing? And one of the things that this requires is thinking a little bit into the future. I mean, I can make I can make tons of, of arguments about representational harm, but I don't even think that we need that we need to go that abstract. Um, this is a paper from last year, robots enact malignant stereotypes. And what they showed was that putting um, a large language model into a robot um, would cause it to, for example, when, when asked to pick up the box with uh, the image of the criminal on it, the, the physical robot would pick up more often um, a box with a photo of a black man on it. Now, I want you to imagine uh, the future of these kinds of robots, um, and we're already putting language models into them. So now imagine that a child is playing with a robot um, and says, hey, I really want to play dolls. Um, can you please bring me um, a doctor? I want to play doctor. I want to play, I want to play with a smart scientist. Or I want to play, um, I want to play parents with my dolls. And a smart scientist, the doctor or the robot always brings um, Ken. And with a parent, the robot always brings Barbie. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we might think about when thinking just a little bit farther in the future. I'm not talking about the robot wars. Um, I'm talking about thinking about the consequences now. Um, so that we can try to mitigate harm as much as possible. Um, so a point that I want to end on here, again, another kind of provocation. Um, I've been doing a lot of work on ethical speculation in the classroom and my PhD advisee Shamika a couple of years ago interviewed a bunch of instructors who have used a teaching exercise that I created called the Black Mirror Writer's Room, where students think about things that might go wrong in the future and then how we might uh, mitigate those harms. And one of the interview participants noted that this can be challenging in a computer science classroom in part because uh, people tend to lean very hard on their own experiences when thinking about potential harms. So you might come up with a user persona, for example, and everyone's like, all right, my user is a middle-class white person. <laughs> and here's the things that might go wrong with them. Um, it is easier for me to imagine harms to me than it is for me to imagine harms to a black woman, for example. Um, and this is just true of everyone. We have to be able to think outside of our own experiences and to care about people who are most vulnerable to technological harms. Now, I, I could make an argument about more diversity in tech, and this is incredibly important. Um, however, I also don't think that it should be on the shoulders of people who are historically excluded from technology once they're brought in to solve all of our problems for us. Um, but it is the case that technological harms disproportionately impact marginalized groups. And even if not talking about generative AI, even just from one of the slides I made four years ago with a five minute search for the word algorithm, <laughs> all of the headlines are about <laughs> harms to marginalized groups. Um, and so I think that one of the really important things to keep in mind here isn't just having more diversity in people designing, but also more diversity and for people who can critique technology. And this is one of the most important things I think for thinking about all of this, including things like foundation models and generative AI, is that we should be making sure that more people understand this technology so that they have the power to critique it.
Um, if you are uh, interested in digging into these ideas a little bit more, um, this talk was based on an op-ed that I wrote uh, for the conversation a couple of months ago, if you want to check that out. Uh, I would love to answer some questions, um, and I'm looking forward to the next panel. So I will leave you with this final thought, which is that critique is an obligation. If we want technology to be the best that it possibly can be, um, then we should be doing the work to make sure that it is. And I will leave you with that. And now I'm going to have a look at, uh, at the Q&A. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I'm I'm already seeing um, a couple of questions in here. Um, so I, but please feel free to put more into the into the Q and A here, um, or also I can just start giving you more examples. Um, so uh, <laughs> one cop, one cop. This is more more a comment than a question, but someone says that classifying this is a bug. Uh, may have been a plan to save chatbot department jobs. Um, you know, I, I, so I know that this was that this was um, uh, a joke, but um, I do, I do think that there's something very interesting happening with respect to conversations about job loss right now, um, because we've been having conversations around job loss around automation for a long time. Um, but when we were talking about factory jobs, the conversation was very different uh, than now when we're talking about programming jobs. Um, and uh, again, right back to my point about um, being able to imagine and care more about the harms to people like you. Um, well, I will. I will just leave. I will just leave it. Leave it at that. Um, so someone asked, um, do you feel that centralized control of AI is a bad trend for society? Is AI better to be used in a decentralized approach? Um, I think that issues of power um, are incredibly important here. One of the, you know, it, there's a lot, there's a lot of ethical issues that have come up in my talk, you know, things like bias and job loss and and labor exploitation um but the other thing that has the potential to happen with any powerful new technology is that a lot of power is um in the hands of a few people the hands of a few of a few companies the hands of a few very wealthy people um and i i think that this is troubling. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm actually troubled by some of the conversations about around AI safety, because a lot of the people who seem to be getting a lot of attention and who are being listened to very closely are people who already have um, a great deal of power and not necessarily the people um, who are in positions uh, where they might be more and more vulnerable, which is again, why I think it's it's really important that we lift up voices and give more people the tools to critique. Um, and actually someone uh, also asks um, uh, how to link critique with ethical debt and how do you operationalize change? Um, that is a, that's a great question. Um, so I'm, I'm sometimes asked, like, you know, I've talked talked about ethics in a lot of different kinds of contexts for a long time. Um, and I also get asked essentially what is the business argument for <laughs> ethics? Um, and I wish I had a better answer to this. Um, honestly, a lot of the ethical issues that we face in a lot of these contexts, including like the, you know, AI race point, like what does that come down to? It comes down to money and power. Um, and it's very difficult to address a lot of these issues when the underlying, when the underlying problem is like, who can amass as much wealth and power um, <laughs> as quickly as possible? Um, I do think there are a couple of things uh, that can that can move the lever, though, um, and one of those, frankly, is bad <laughs> is attention, bad attention, bad PR. Um, I think we are starting to see some cases where this matters, um, where people talk about um, being more likely to use a certain product or a certain company because they've heard that they have more ethical practices. Um, I think, so I do think that this kind of thing can matter. 
I also think that um, organizations that help bring people's voices together to have, um, for example, a policy voice is very helpful. Um, often big tech has a lot more lobbying power than say consumer um, advocacy organizations. I mean, the point that was made earlier about how abysmal the state of data privacy law in this country is compared to copyright is so true. And that is exactly why. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that people talking very loudly about these things is very important. Um, a very troubling trend um, has been a number of layoffs on responsible AI um, and ethical tech teams at big tech companies. Um, and I'm glad to see so much attention to that because at least it's a bad look um, for them. <laughs> um, I do, however, think that at some point there has to be um, regulation. And I think that it's very important that we not think too long-term for regulation. So for example, um, OpenAI put out a statement a few days ago saying that it's so important that we that we <laughs> think about regulation for super intelligence, but just to be clear, we don't mean today's AI, we're talking about science fiction <laughs> AI. Um, so I think that, that I think that that's going to end up being really important. Um, I know I only have like a minute left, so let me see if I can, if I can lightning round through these last two questions. Um, do, do I feel that ethical debt needs to be looked at through a software development life cycle lens, similar to life cycle lens, similar to technical debt? In very interesting point. Um, yes, uh, I do think that's a good way to look at it, and particularly because it encourages thinking about things um, sooner. Um, uh, and, uh, ah, uh, I, um, a, a question from, uh, from Michael, um, an institutional motivation, uh, imperative for ethics is staying out of court and preserving the organization's reputation. That is an excellent point. Um, uh, and I actually think ties into the point that sometimes regulation is what we're going to have to have, because frankly, if someone won't do something out of the kindness of their heart and they don't care about, bad PR, um, then regulation becomes the only lever that we can pull. Um, and so I hope that we make some really important strides in that area. Um, so I will leave it at that because I believe I'm out of time. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Casey. As you promised, that was indeed an excellent provocation. And uh, I look forward to hearing the panel's additional thoughts on this topic. Um, we'll see you soon. Um, our next panel is moderated by Cody Turner, who's a tech ethics postdoctoral fellow at Notre Dame. His current work focuses on how emerging wearable and implantable AI cognitive assistant devices, such as smart watches, smart glasses, smart contact lenses, and neural implants are poised to affect the mind from a metaphysical, ethical, and epistemological perspective. He received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Connecticut, and will be moderating a panel discussing opportunities and risks and foundation models and guardrails for enterprises. Welcome, Cody. Thanks so much, Aaron. Uh, this alarm just started going off behind me, so hopefully that's not too much of a nuisance. So the topic for this panel is going to be diving more into the opportunities and risks and foundation models and guardrails for enterprises. Um, and I'm honored to introduce our two panelists. First, we have Trevenia Gandhi. She's a data scientist, a thought leader, and advocate for the responsible use of AI. Um, she likes to find simple solutions to complicated problems. As the responsible AI lead at Dataki, that's Dataku, probably butchered that, she builds and implements custom solutions to support the responsible and safe scaling of artificial intelligence. Previously, Giovanni worked as a data analyst at a large nonprofit dedicated to improving educational outcomes in New York, and she received a doctorate in political science from Cornell University. Thanks so much for joining us today, Giovanni. And we also have as the second panelist, Pinyu Chen, who is the principal research scientist at the IBM Thomas J. Watson Research Center. He's also the chief scientist of the RPI IBM AI Research Collaboration and a PI of an ongoing MIT IBM Watson AI Lab project. Um, Penu's recent research focuses on adversarial machine learning and robustness of neural networks. His long-term research vision is to build trustworthy machine learning systems. He's the co-author of the book, Adversarial Robustness for Machine Learning, and received his PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of Michigan. Thanks so much for joining us today, Penu. 
Um, so this is essentially going to kind of unfold like the first panel. Each of you can make your first remarks, then we'll have a conversation and then open it up to Q&A. So uh, do you want to start us off perhaps, Trevenny? Yes, thank you, Cody, and thank you everyone for, for having me here today. Uh, the company I work for, the name is Data IQ, kind of like haiku with data, um, <laughs> but totally fair that it is weird to pronounce if you've only read it. Uh, so I wanted to kick off today, uh, I had a prepared set of thoughts, but then the last speaker's comments like kind of hit me, uh, hit me in a different way. The sort of business case for AI ethics, especially around generative AI, uh, I think is really important. And that idea of bad PR um, is, is quite powerful when it comes to these cases. You know, the most recent thing I can think of is the helpline that fired all of their real people and replaced it with a chatbot. And the chatbot was actually being very harmful towards the people that needed help from this helpline, I think, for eating disorders. So that bad PR aspect is really important. Um, but I would argue, too, that the regulations that, you know, people are calling for that are forthcoming, a lot of that can be very powerful as well. I think that that can be a very strong motivator. And then I do think even though we live in a late stage capitalist society, there are people who have a sense of ethical code, who do have a sense of goals to do better or to use AI for better, um, to not repeat the mistakes of the past. And I think that finding those voices, amplifying them, supporting them and, and working together with folks like Pinyu to create the tooling to, to be able to actually execute on those values. That's also very important. Like we shouldn't just say that generative AI is here and businesses don't care or, you know, everyone's in it for themselves, which is true to an extent, but we can also try and capitalize and activate those folks who are uh, in it for the right reasons. Um, you know, and I think the three of us on this call or on this panel are, are those kind of people too. So um, I think that's my, my opening remark, which is to say that there's a lot of opportunity here to do, to do bad, but also to do good. Thanks so much. Can you? Yeah, so thanks, Cody, for inviting me here. And it's really my pleasure to uh, be joining the panelists with uh, Trevenny. So I think we'll have a very uh, a comprehensive discussion about the, the ethical use and also on the technical side and on the policy side of, of the story. So a little bit background from, from me, right? So I came from a group called Trustworthy AI, right? So we are dedicated to build those tools, or right? those guardrail tools to improve the trustworthiness of uh, current AI systems. And we cover... Uh, different dimensions like fairness, uh, robustness, uh, security, uh, explainability, uh, privacy, and all the way to the recent uh, foundation models, we are in, interested in looking into the safety and harm or ethical implications that could bring by those uh, foundation models. Right? And uh, personally, I'm a machine learning researcher, so, so as I'll, I'll continuously be uh, impressed by how fast this field grows, right? Like, from a technical perspective, right, uh, the transformers, right, the building block of the foundation model right, was just introduced back in 2016, right, and then like a six or seven years from now, right, we have like a GPT, and GPT itself was introduced like two years, right, and then ChatGPT was uh, announced like last year, uh, late last year, and then now everybody is using ChatGPT on Bing, uh, using Bart, and so on, right, so uh, it's really a, like a fast uh, pacing uh, technology, especially at IBM, right, when I compare the, the development of quantum technology versus AI, right, I certainly see uh, like a different uh, speed and different uh, pace, right? So, uh, but at the same time, while we are enjoying, enjoying and anticipating this uh, benefits that are bringing by this new technology, at the same time, we also need to make sure uh, they are safe and responsible to use, right? Especially uh, from enterprise or res responsible AI perspective. So I'm happy to you know, have a more discussion on that. Awesome. Yeah, well, that's, I think that's a great jumping off point for a question I'd be interested to get both of your insights on. And that's, um, you know, in the class that I teach here, one theme that I've noticed in tech ethics is that oftentimes technological innovation far outpaces kind of sensible regulation and design implementation, right? The, the technology is thrust out into the world and then it causes havoc. And then we kind of pick up the pieces and try to implement correct uh, regulation. I feel like in some sense, we're only just starting to do that with um, these big tech companies kind of inventing the rules of the digital economy in the beginning of the 21st century. So my question here is, um, to your point, Pinyu, as this 
AI technology continues to advance at this rapid, unprecedented pace, how can regulations keep pace to ensure that these foundation models are used responsibly? And especially everything that we've been talking about today with respect to the dynamics of the, the kind of AI arms race. Um, a concern that I have is just that, you know, as these as we're talking about technologies that are increasingly sophisticated right. and autonomous, we might not necessarily have the opportunity to pick up the pieces and um, before it causes some you know, catastrophic harms to society. So how, how do you think we deal with that? Keep regulations keeping pace with the uh, with the pace of AI technology advancing rapidly? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great question. And so as a technical person, I, I think good and bad to put uh, uh, this prototype or like uh, immature products uh, to the world, right? To do this massive uh, testing, right? On, on the one hand, we can have a faster turnaround to get feedback uh, from the users, right, to understand, uh, to to do debugging at a greater scale, to, and then to understand in the user level, right, what could be perceived uh, wrong or problematic, right, that that could not have been observed when in the development stage. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, right, we also see a lot of uh, these misuse cases, right, a, a lot of them relates to uh, un unfairness or ethical concerns. Uh, being brought up, right? So I think regulation, in my opinion, regulation is always one step behind uh, technology, right? We first need to see what the technology is. First, is it really impacting the uh, so, uh, the society and the, the, the te technology? And then uh, we, we will think about how to regulate them, right? And then a, a, a lot of times I was looking back, right? Because uh, we are living in a very interesting era right now. So I was looking back into what are the similar, uh, like a big wave of technology innovation that we can bro uh, learn experience from, right? Like, and then I was thinking about like World Wide Web, right? Or like a, a wireless technology, like a cell phones, right? Like uh, when they first invented, right? There's basically no no regulation, right? But after that, we we keep adding regulation in terms of like a, uh, the, the the power right uh, that can be used by these wireless devices or uh, what can be uh, disseminated on the web or not right so I think uh, as a, a society uh, we are very organic and we learn uh, benefit from those technology we learn uh, from mistakes or uh, misuses or uh, uh, failure modes from those technology and then we regulate to make sure they are on the right path and safe use uh, but I'm very curious to uh, what uh, Trevini thinks about this uh, question yeah I think it's a great question and and you know I appreciate that we have to first learn a little bit before we can start regulating. I would argue that we've learned enough, right? Like we've seen enough harms. We've seen 20 years of like the Facebooks of the world, um, you know, the, the metas and the whatever, all of this coming to fruition. Um and I think that it's even though technology keeps developing, uh, I, and this is something that you kind of picked up in you, which is that it's not, you don't need to regulate the technology. You need to regulate the use case, right? And that's what the EU AI Act is doing quite well, which is to say, is this a high risk use case or not? Um, and that, that risk factor around how it impacts people, how it impacts society is more important than saying, okay, you're model specifications must be X, Y, Z, because that'll always be one step ahead, maybe 10 steps ahead. Um, so one, I think it's an acknowledgement that technology is developing and like we might not be able to regulate it the same way. Um, and I think this goes back to the point that was made at the in the last panel that like, or the last conversation that I can't build a nuclear warhead in my garage, but I can build an AI on my computer. So, okay, you're not going to be able to like manage that. You're not be able, going to be able to contain that, but you can contain who is able to benefit from it or who's able to put it into production. Um, and that's where we need to be focusing our efforts. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, so yeah, I guess a question that maybe is related to this is what should the role of third party audits be in ensuring the compliance of foundation models with existing regulations? Uh, I'd be interested to get both of your perspectives on that question. Yeah, I think, well, <laughs> I don't know how many regulations really exist right now on on foundation models, right? Like enforceable regulations. There's a lot of standards out there. There are a lot of like proposals. Um, but I do think third party audit can be quite beneficial. Um, my concern with that is that, you know, someone comes in and says stamp of approval, right? But how do we trust the person who gave that stamp was in a position to, to do so? How do we know that that third party is not actually 
you know, in some sort of relationship with the the group that they're so-called approving, who who watches the Watchmen, right? Um, and and uh, I also I also worry that you know with this sort of auditing function, it's like here's your stamp, you're good to go, and you never have to think about it again. When in fact, this is a constantly evolving conversation. And for my clients, I tell them, great, we talked about it, but you're gonna need to come back in three months and look at this again. You're going to need to measure impacts. You're going to need to measure drift. Um, and the concept of a approval feels very final. And I think that's concerning for me. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with the tremendous new, like we should really regulate and audit the use cases rather than the technology itself, right? Because we we keep seeing the repeating patterns like the before like the foundation models, right? Like uh, we, we talk about fairness, right? Explainability of those uh, uh, deep learning models and like being unfair or being uh, unjustifiable, right? And then same thing, right? The same problem still exists, right? Carry over to the uh, chat GBT era, right? So. Um, and in terms of auditing, right? so in, in enterprise, I do see more and more activities. They have this, uh, uh, what we call a red teaming team, right? An independent team, right? That try to, like, that try to do independent audits or, uh, or like, you know, stress testing of the models they are going, or products they are going to deploy. Uh, and there is also, uh, we can have a third party uh, auditing team to come in to, uh, uh, to, to check whether you, you, your product uh, satisfies the regulation or not, or like uh, uh, the, the rights to be forgotten or any like data privacy related issues. Uh, but on a technical perspective, right, it's still very, very wide open in terms of uh, what metrics, right, like what uh, things we should audit, right, and what, how do you, for example, for security, right, how can you uh, determine whether a, a, a model is uh, secure or robust to use or not, or, or to what extent? Uh, in, in certain areas like privacy, we do kind of more or less have a consensus like a differential privacy, right? That everybody has, will go to that metric and uh, audit or validate uh, how much information can be leaked from the system. But in terms of these newer uh, ethical or societal concerns, right? Like a uh, factualness, like a harm, uh, like uh, explainability, right? Those are more like open-ended questions and there may not be a good mathematical uh, yeah. metrics or scores to help us quantify. Uh, and uh, in, in a complete way uh, in terms of those societal issues. So that's uh, from a technical side, I think I think editing, auditing is necessary, right? But what to audit and how to audit is still remains a very open question. Yeah, it's, it's funny, just to follow up on that, like I've seen a couple places where they say, oh, this is our framework for measuring the, or like the responsiveness of this thing. And it's like a complicated formula of like, did you meet this criteria times two? And that is weighted in this much. And I'm like, no, stop it. <laughs> You're just repeating the same problem. And now everyone's gonna optimize for this score that doesn't mean anything. And so like, if we are building technology to improve society, to interact with society, then we need to approach it with a techno-social approach and not just a techno approach with some social slapped on at the end. Hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but like not like approaching it as like technology mathematical with social ideas but really truly integrated techno-social concepts. Right, right. Um, yeah, so I kind of wanted to, for this next question, I wanted to circle back to the conversation that was being had about uh, power and the worries surrounding the centralization of power regarding this AI technology. And I kind of have two questions along these lines. Um, first, how can regulators ensure that the deployment of these foundation models doesn't widen the digital divide or lead to unfair practices, right? The digital divide being those who reap the benefits of digital technologies and those who don't. And then second, how can we make sure that the deployment of these foundation models can be made accessible to small and medium enterprises as opposed to just the large tech corporations, right? How can, how can we decentralize the AI revolution such that um, smaller and more medium enterprises can reap some financial gain as well. Uh, either you can take either part of that first, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, I just have to shout out Hugging Face because Hugging Face has actually opened up a bunch of foundation models and made it very easy to access. Um, sure, you have to pay for some compute and all that, um, but they are doing that and they are recognizing that there are going to be concerns and issues and how do you manage those issues with bias and toxicity in let's say language models. But uh, I think it, this is a very weird space because it is closed and open. Um, you know, OpenAI's actual 
model is closed behind whatever, but anybody could access it using their front end. Um, but at the same point, anybody can also go and build a language model. Um, and that's why like these tools like Hugging Face or even, you know, Data IQ lets people build models. Um, so I don't think the issue is of access or ability to, 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 to use the model. I think the disparity comes in the, the benefit, the, the use case, the ability to actually, um, you know, like you say, deploy. And, and that's where then you get that twofold disparity of between enterprise, big, big tech giants and small and medium businesses and how, who's able to capitalize on that. But then you get the other digital divide of who's affected by it, right? And people who are being, um, you know, access to goods or something is, a, is the result of an AI model, but they don't know that or they don't know how to interact with that or how to contest it. That's a different kind of divide. And you yeah, I, I, I certainly see this uh, divide uh, uh, coming up in, in different uh, aspects, right? The, the, so the first aspect is like the the, the right to access those uh, assets, right? Like it reminds me of those uh, during COVID, right? Because the schools are shut down, right? And then uh, there are students who don't have uh, computers, right? They can they, they lose the opportunity to continue their education, right? And then uh, like, a, uh, like a governments like uh, New York State, they actually uh, offer free uh, laptops right, for those students to use those devices. So I think I certainly see, uh, predict this uh, digital divide will come in the sense that for people who know how to use those uh, tools versus the people who don't know how to use those tools, right? So that's one type of digital divide. And the other type of digital device, uh, like this uh, uh, big supply chain or like e economy of those uh, large language models, right? So we all know uh, training these uh, foundation models are very expensive, right? Like the predicted cost of uh, GPT-4 is like, uh, I believe like 100 uh, trillion or something like that, or 100 billion, something around that range, right? So it's pretty expensive, right? But but they are still willing to, the, some companies, they are still too willing to open source their uh, valuable uh, models, right? The reason is they want to own the e ecosystem, right? Like uh, similar to uh, Android versus uh, Apple iOS, right? They want to own the ecosystem and they want others, right? Like small uh, enterprises or uh, model developers to build their applications, right? To to create dependencies on on the uh, the very foundation model they created. So uh, it could be a good news or a bad news uh, if you are thinking about the safeguarding those uh, uh, applications. Right? On one hand, we only have a few foundation models right, to take care of. Right? On the other hand, right, if those foundation models are uh, broken or are problematic, right, then all the derived applications and technology right, will be at risk. Right? So it, it's the good and bad thing, like uh, Tremini uh, mentioned. Um, but I, I certainly think that uh, many enterprises want to go into this business of foundation model because it easily creates this barrier, right? If you don't have enough compute power, if you don't have enough data to train, right? It's, it's uh, very difficult to join the game. Right. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to pick up on this distinction between open source and closed sourcing these foundation models. Trevani, you're talking about how open AI, they're not really open in the sense that it's closed, but it's <sighs> open on the front end. And I wanted to... Think about the distinction in the context of the AI control problem or what's called the AI alignment problem. Um, you know, how we're going to have program values and AI such that they're aligned with human values and well being. Uh, how do you, I guess the first question would be, how do you think about that in general? And how do you think about that with respect to this distinction between open source and closed sourcing foundation models? Does open sourcing foundation models make the AI control problem harder to solve? Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, the first thing is that we need to define what our human values are, right? And like, when I go into a, a client and they're talking to me about, we wanna do responsible AI, I say, well, what does that mean? What are your values that you're actually trying to embed into that AI? And if you haven't defined that up front, we can't even proceed, right? And so like, you know, OpenAI has these like flowery, flowery letters and things that they write about how it's all for the good of hu humankind but we don't understand the specifics of what they're actually trying to do. So like, let's first get those things settled. And that's where, again, where like the ethics, the philosophy can't just be ignored or like mathematicalized away. They have to be debated and discussed. Um, when it comes to the open versus closed thing though, I mean, there's, 
I think there's value in closed systems that are happening inside of a given company where there's like this sense of governance and control over the whole operation. You've got your values in place. You know how they're being executed on in every part of the pipeline. That's different um, than like the closed model of, of OpenAI, which is to say, we're not going to tell you what the training data was. We're not going to tell you how we built these parameters. We're not telling you anything, but here, go use it, right? That's a different kind of closed. Um, and then, you know, the open AI or, or open models like those in Hugging Face where someone can pick up and retrain. Now that's a different kind of openness where you have the ability to then inject new values or inject new controls. Um, so it's kind of layered in that in that sense. Yeah, for, for me, I, I certainly see open sourcing as a very uh, becoming a very critical uh, a step toward uh, accelerating alignment, right? Like uh, like like Trevini said, like right? when ChatGPT or GPT four was first released, there's only a report saying, okay, I we did some red teaming, and then there are, there are some possible misuses and uh, risks, right? but that's all, right? You don't get any information, and then you don't get to. Uh, uh, play with the model, right? To 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 have the weights of the model to get to know more details, or even do some independent evaluation, right? Not to mention reproducibility, right? But uh, but since like uh, uh, other um, uh, tech companies, right? Like for example, Meta, they release their open source uh, language model like Llama, right? We see a, a very fast uh, uh, evolution in terms of you know building on top of those technology, right? With some human instruction, right? To make them more aligned, or even we see a, a, a inverse trend, right? Like previously, the language models are becoming huge and huge, but uh, with the more recent uh, techniques, right, we, we see an inverse trend, like uh, reducing the size uh, 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 of the language model, but still keeping the same uh, capability, which is actually a good thing, which means they are more deployable than uh, previous language models. So I think open sourcing right, really helps uh, accelerating and democratizing uh, the process of uh, alignment and uh, helps uh, uh, more uh, uh, like a uh, organic and healthy uh, ecosystem to develop this technology. Awesome, thank you. And and Pinyu, just to, uh, if I could follow up a little bit on the AI control problem and feel free to jump in as well, if you have any. Sure. Um, from a kind of technical standpoint, uh, how can enterprises test the robustness and reliability of these foundation models in a safe controlled environment um, before deployment, right? Like, like you said, uh, a lot of times it kind of has to be deployed and then you get the user feedback and then the appropriate regulation comes in after the fact. But if we're going to take the control problem seriously. It seems there needs to be testing um, in this kind of safe controlled environment before it's released out into the wild. And then also, are there ways to design, uh, I guess, safe fail stop mechanisms for foundation models in cases of unforeseen dangerous circumstances? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I, I believe in the earlier panel, they also bring up this idea of the AI life cycle. Right? So I also want to use that to pitch why, why should we care about this safeguarding, right? So I would argue like no matter in what stage of the AI technology, we should have some safeguard rails, right? And then and then, and then we and then we can think about this AI life cycle in terms of starting from how you collect those data and then what models you decide to train on those data. And then you know, what training is required to tune your model and then how you deploy the model to the world, right? So that constitutes the whole AI life cycle from development to deployment. And in the entire process, right, there's a lot of tools that we can employ, right, to ensure the models you are developing are in good states, right? So for example, we can develop a tool to inspect the quality of the data, right? It's, for example, a lot of uh, toxicity and harm uh, of the behavior that the model is showing is actually caused by, you know, toxic and problematic uh, training data. And then if you remove those data, you will alleviate that problem. And when you train your data, right, what methods you are using to train those uh, data? Are you incorporating uh, different constraints like fairness, right, explainability, uh, privacy into the training, right? That will also affect the performance of the model. And all the way to you when you deploy your model, right? We we should also have some like continuous monitoring scheme, uh, a schema, right? In addition to uh like a uh, uh, uh one one shot uh, auditing or so, it should be some continuous uh, monitoring to evaluate the status of the model, right? Like we say that the, the language model is a very dynamic thing, right? Not to mention you can create your own session and have your own uh like a chatbot, right? Personalized uh, chatbot, right? When when they try to learn from what you want to ask and interact with you, right? So in the whole process, right, uh, we need to develop something that could monitor the the value or the harmfulness uh, of of those uh, conversations, right? Like there are scenarios in Europe, like uh, actually chat chatbot actually support the decision of. Uh, suicide 
right, of, of some person, right? So we see that certainly see some like it's the, it's a, it's a matter of life, right? Like how can we stop the conversation or even change the tone, right? Uh, by having a way of monitoring and measuring the how the conversation goes, right? So I think those are the things that we are developing, and there are also some tools available to. Uh, to insert to, 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 to uh, in, in different stages of the AI life cycle to ensure uh, we have a reliable AI system. I think I think at the end of the day, right, it's you don't need to be the first person to put this out. You don't need to rush to get it out the door. You don't need to rush to get out in front of users. Take the time to build it right. Take the time to stress test it. Put up these crazy use cases in front of your system and see how it goes before you deploy it. This whole idea of move fast, break things, whatever, fail fast, that doesn't work anymore. It didn't work then, right? Mm -hmm. It only worked because those people made a bunch of money off of it, but it harmed everyone in the process. So let's not do that anymore and let's do it the right way so that we can use this technology for longer and in, in a more effective way. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, we're almost to the Q and A portion. I, perhaps I'll ask one more question and then go to Q and A. So I was just wondering if each of you could follow up. Um, you've already kind of touched upon this in in various ways, but the transparency and trust aspects of this, and you can address this from a policy or a technical standpoint. How can enterprises foster transparency and trust in their use of these foundation models with both internal and external um, stakeholders? I mean, this is something I talk about with my clients all the time, which is that whenever you're building a model, whether or not it's foundational, generative language, a, a linear regression, whenever you're using a model to then make a decision about somebody or to inform someone else's access or something, that needs to be stated right up front to both the person who's going to make the decision, to the person who's going to have the decision made about them. And there needs to be a mechanism to be able to say, here's why, right? The explainability for that individual is super important. Um, and, you know, it's it's funny because like now you've seen how ChatGPT has been like kind of re retailored and like brought back, like kind of reined in. Um, I've personally never used it just like out of like my own like moral code, not moral code, but just like I think stubbornness. But my husband's a big fan of it and you know, we're we're going to Europe, and I said, okay, ask ChatGPT what the weather is going to be like. And he said, what's the weather going to be like in June between these dates in June? And ChatGPT said, I am a language model. I was trained on old data, so I can't tell you anything about the future, right? And so, like that kind of like caveating up front is actually very helpful, right? Being able to say, here's a response, but keep in mind, whatever you're hearing is not. A person on the other end is not a sentient being on the other end. It's just a set of probabilistic learnings. Um, and I think being just like, I think I worry a lot about the anthropomorphization, I can never say that word, of AI systems. And like the idea of hallucinations is also saying that. So, like, let's call it misinformation, let's call it requirements, you know, let's call it sort of, um, call it what it is. And that in, in itself starts building the transparency around we're using this this is how we're planning for you to use it this is what you should use it for and these are its strict limitations yeah and uh before you jump in pin you uh so Giovanni, she highlighted the uh, explainability factor there as an important aspect of securing trust and transparency but uh, there's anything you can say like technically speaking about how you make these foundation models more explainable and interpretable Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so before I answer that, I, I, I probably want to uh, answer the first question. So, so I, I think, uh, we, we need to, uh, for transparency, right? We need to, uh, do things, uh, in a joint effort, right? From the enterprise as well as the end users, right? So at the enterprise level, right, we should uh, also be certainly be need, need to provide more information about how we train a model and what data are we used to train those model and what use cases that we recommend to use this model and what use cases that we strictly uh, uh, don't recommend to use, right? Like those, uh, uh, so, so there are efforts like that, like model cards, right? Like fact sheets. And nowadays when you uh, upload a, a foundation model to Chugging Face, right, they actually I ask you to provide those uh, usage cases. So I think that's a very good starting point, but we, every company and every enterprise should uh, do more. Uh, but on the other hand, I also think the users needs to uh, adapt or learn why it's the right way to use those, those tools, right? So 
one analogy I didn't like, but it's actually broadcasting everywhere. It's like now we are treating this chat GPT as a new search engine. And for me, this is very, very wrong, right? So first of all, when we use the word search tool or search engine, we are expecting it to help us find the right answer. But actually, this is a generative tool, right? It, it, it is actually generates something, but there's no guarantee it is factual, it is correct, right? So I think the right way to use this generative AI is actually to use it for a creative task, right? Like we, I can create a very new art piece, right? Or a very nice, nicely looking article without uh, con considering it is right or not, right? Like a Picasso wouldn't worry about it. Like a cat is a, looks like a real cat or not, but it's a very creative, right? So I think that would be the right use of uh, those new tools instead of using it as a, as a search engine, right? That kind of, uh, I think that's giving a very wrong impression uh, to the end user. And also when users are using those uh, uh, applications, right, they're actually expecting they are talking to, to an artificial human, right? Like a, with human level capability understanding, but it's actually, again, very wrong, right? This is just a, a autoregressive model, right? So it's a mathematical model that learns to generate something that feels like a human, but it's actually, you no know, does not think and act like a human, right? So that kind of uh, expectation is what we need to uh, educate and also, uh, uh, reinforce this knowledge to the end users so we have a right expectation on the technology. Uh, and to your point of uh, interpretability and explainability, right? So this is a very challenging task. Like uh, Trevini said, right? We need some like so a social technology solution to it, right? Because explainability and interpretability uh, at the end, right? We want them to be interpretable to human, right? Which means uh, the explanations uh, may not be able to define the clearly in a mathematical way. And it, it, it's very difficult to uh, quantify the, the level of explainability, right? And it also depends on who you are explaining the idea to, right? Like I, I, when I explain foundation model to an expert in AI versus an average person using AI technology, right? My explanation can be very different, but they are both useful. Right, so so um, over the years we have tried to draw inspirations from like a diagnostic, right, or like some, uh, for example, like for a medical diagnostic, they will actually provide some examples, like oh, this uh, I I predicted you have this uh, uh disease because you know uh other people in in the same population who have this disease will have certain behavior and and you are you your your diagnosis belongs to this category or things like that, so we can. I think the, the, the easiest thing is to try to provide some examples of uh, justifying why the machine is making this decision by contrasting the your case to other uh, existing cases, right? And that kind of uh, uh, contrastive uh, explanation is very useful and it's actually being uh, used in IBM's uh, technology as well, right? But it's, it's like a very baby step compared to the, the real explanation and inter interpretability that we have in mind. Thanks so much, Penyu. And to Benny. So now I'm going to turn to Q and A. We have about ten minutes, I think, for Q and A. Um, I'm seeing someone wrote that Penyu, you just won an IJC AI award for your research. Congrats on that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. What, what what really excites me is that uh, in, in their comments they are saying, okay, you I'm, I'm dedicating to you know converting these uh, properties of trust and safety into some rigorous uh, algorithmic procedure and computable metrics to improve AI systems. I'm very happy to hear that the summary because that's exactly my entire career is dedicated to. It's very important work. Um, so we have a question from Michael. Michael says to Trevani, I agree that it's time to regulate and I agree that the crucial part is about technology and use. Can we regulate at two levels? That is to say use cases, but also families of use cases. For example, facial recognition technologies often lead to biased outcomes. We can regulate a use case, a particular instance of facial recognition, but can we also regulate um, application domains for facial recognition technologies? Yeah, no, I think that's actually what needs to be regulated, right? Is the application domain um, informed by the potential use cases? Um, so if we can create application domains that we understand to be, I just learned this term, MISI, mutually exclusive, completely exhaustive, um, we can say that, okay, we've covered the gamut of what is potentially um, the domain of application. And if it's in this domain, we should be um, mindful, right? So like facial recognition, you know, using it in the application for policing, for surveillance, for, um, yeah, I guess policing and surveillance is the one where I would be like, whoa, um, watch out, uh, let's, let's consider this, um, versus regulating AI in banking is going to be about like access to goods or quality of goods when it's in 
medical. It's about how your uh, how how close is this AI to a point of care decision on a on a patient. Like that's different. So I, I think that like broadly, you start with these applications and or industries, and then from there, you're able to kind of create the groupings that are necessary. Anything you want to add, Penny? Not I can just go. To yeah, the yeah. I, I I think that makes total sense. And then for, for those high risks, right, high stakes decision making process, right, like uh, uh, like autonomous driving, for example, I think those things are certainly needs to be regulated. And then uh, in terms of the use cases, right, I think we can again draw inspiration from like a uh, uh, cell phones and internet, right. Like when you take exams, right, it's regulated or uh, uh, specified that like you cannot use this internet or cell phones to search for answers. But uh, for G uh, language models, uh, we are still under the debate. Right? We see cases where students use those uh, language models to, right, to complete their assignments and even uh, win uh, like an artist uh, competition awards right, by using these tools to generate uh, art pieces. Right? So I think regulations are essentially needed right, in certain use cases right, just to make sure uh, the, the technology is used in a safe and responsible way. I think mostly in, I think uh, for low, low risk tasks, it's okay to use those tools, but for certain scenarios, we should certainly ban the, the use of this uh, technology. So Frank has a question. He asks, do you feel third party auditors should be able to stress test the AI models for some kind of rules of engagement slash ethics evaluation? Think the same way as we would for the solvency of a commercial banking institution, then report on the results made available for public critique. Is that a good approach for a transparency and gaining confidence in AI to improve society? Either of you can take that first. Yeah, that, that, that's a great uh, idea. I, actually, we, we have been advocating something like AI safety report, right? So as an independent auditor, you can take a model, right? Either a black box model or a white box model, and then run a bunch of tests, right? And then you score them, right? Depending on what uh, dimension you care about, like a fairness, explainability, robustness, whatever. And then you create this report, right? And then you show those uh, reports to uh, any enterprise users, right, or any users, so they will say, okay, uh, now I'm going to use, uh, like, like a, just like a car, right, they have this safety report, and then if you care about safety, you will use, uh, you you will say, oh, I'm going to buy this model rather than that model, because this model, right, is independently tested to be safer to drive or something like that, so I think a lot of things can draw inspiration from this car uh, maintenance and car in industry, right, to, uh, to standardize this uh, practice. Yeah, I think I think it's I think it's a very interesting idea. Um, I do think that the idea of making it publicly available requires a level of like technical understanding in the general population to be effective. Like, I'll be honest, I don't go and check up on the like value of like banks or like the solvency of a commercial bank, right? I don't know what it means, and I don't frankly care. Um, so, is the average person who is just interested in using mid journey to make some cool art for their their games or something like do they really want to go and be like okay let me ass assess mid journeys so i think that there's um a question of like how much do people care about that regulation versus how much do we do we as developers and builders and ethicists care about the um fact that such sort of like institution exists and that that institution itself is um, trustworthy because I don't care about the regulations on which parts can be put into my cell phone. That doesn't bother me, right? But like someone does, and I want to know that those people are trustworthy. Um, but I think then that's a bigger question of just like what is society, right? Like, right. how do we put trust into one another? And that's that's a different. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more question or so. Uh, so Marcus asks. What legislation or oversight do you think should be instated to ensure users cannot leverage adversarial queries to perform weight stealing? That is to say, in the Stanford alpaca way or similar. Do you believe in a large language model that is fine tuned from targeted queries of another large language model constitute novel intellectual property, particularly if the underlying architectures differ substantially? Do you want me to reread that? Um, so what legislation or oversight do you think should be instated to ensure users cannot leverage adversarial queries to perform weight stealing in the way in the Stanford alpaca way? 
Yeah, I, I think I understand the question is coming from, so there's a lot of lawsuits happening while we speak, right? Because those foundation models are trained on whatever data they can collect it. And most of the time they are violating the IP laws, right? Like uh, infringement, especially like when they collect data from GitHub, which is the largest uh, code repository for storing different uh, programming codes. And also there's artists, right? And uh, being, uh, they, they, they claim their, their, their styles are being mimicked, right? But by those uh, art generation uh, networks, right? And so I think this is a, a, a persistent law problem and I, I don't think we should ignore them, right? And then we should have a way of regulating and, and have the right to ask those uh, services to remove uh, similar styles and also you know, even personal information if we feel they are infringing on our rights. Uh, but how to do that, how to identify, how to do auditing, right? To identify, okay, you are using my style and how, how can you verify that case and who should uh, help you uh, uh, win the fight and so on. I think that's uh, still a very long way. And then, uh, but other than this uh, uh, obvious IP violation issues, I think it's okay to uh, use a language model to uh, teach and other language model just to do have this uh, self-improvement. Right? Like uh, we have this uh, in machine learning, we have this uh, teacher-student model scenario where you use a teacher to uh, to teach a student and then the student will later become a teacher to take, teach the next student and then you just iterate to make the model better, right? But a lot of times, uh, some of the language models also have their own license restrictions, right? They are limited uh, commercial use or they are limited to uh, uh, to train in other language models. So there are obvious restrictions provided by this language model. But the uh, DBMA uh, aside, I think in general, this is a good idea to uh, have this a uh, teacher student mode uh, iterating to uh, e eventually evolve to have a better uh, language model at the end. I will say on the question of like IP rights and generative AI, I used to have this very like strong stance of like, m like the mid journeys and the dollies and all this, this is not fair to the original artist and all this. And I had an actual artist challenge me who said, well, look, you go out and see sources of artists you like, and then you take inspiration from that. Or like he was a cin cinematographer. Um, and so he was like, I am building, I make movies in, in homage or in the style of someone else. Right. And so, like, how is that different than what this is doing? Um, and to be fair, for anyone who's ever had to write a line of code, we've all gone to Stack Overflow and we've all copy pasted the solution into our code and it works and it's great. How is this different? Right. And you could argue there's a, a scale thing where now anybody can go out and like copy it and like whatever. But fundamentally, we're still just doing the same thing. And so, I don't know that it's as easy of a of an answer, um, and I think that's where the like especially IP around art is very confusing. IP around GitHub code, you know, um, yeah. So I don't have an answer. It's just a very con confusing conversation. Yeah, it's it seems. Um, well, I guess we're out of time. So I was just going to say it. It seems like maybe more manageable in the case of just like training something on Drake's data and then creating a fake Drake song, then taking. Oh, yeah taking training data from all kinds of different musical artists, right? And then yielding a novel product. Um, seems like the IP issues get more thorny in that case. But we're out of time. I want to thank you both very much for taking the time and providing your insights. I really learned a lot and enjoyed thank the conversation. Thank you so much. This was a really thank great you. chat. Same here. Thank you. Thank you, Cody, Pinyu, and Trevaney. Your perspectives have brought additional depth and meaning to this morning's conversation. As we move forward, I'm particularly grateful for the variety of voices who contributed to this symposium. As we all continue to learn about foundation models and trace the implications of their use in enterprise contexts, both for good and in ways that are or may be harmful, it's vital for us to engage with those who build the tools, those who study them, those who regulate them, those who deploy them, and those who use them. Engaging a variety of perspectives helps us suss out the ethical challenges that must be considered as new tools are developed and as we seek just ways of using such tools. It's been a privilege to hear from our speakers, moderators, and panelists here today. I'm also grateful to all of you who attended. Thank you for your attention and thoughtful questions. On behalf of myself and the lab's IBM co-director, Kathy Quinlan, I'd like to thank the organizers of the symposium, Heather Doman, the IBM associate director of the lab, Nicole McAuley, the lab's program manager, and Jung Min Lee, the program manager for the chief privacy office at IBM, as well as our partners at ND Studios for producing this event. 
For all of you out there, please be sure to follow the lab on Twitter at Tech Ethics Lab and the Notre Dame Technology Ethics Center on LinkedIn. There you'll find announcements related to lab events, projects, and funding initiatives. And we especially encourage you to be watchful for the lab's announcement of our upcoming call for proposals, which will be released later this summer. We anticipate it will seek projects related to the theme of the ethical use of foundation models and enterprises, which we've spent time discussing here today. We look forward to staying connected with all of you as you continue your important work in this area. Have a wonderful rest of your day.